25% off fine jewelry. Sounds pretty good, right? Missouri's biggest sale ever is here. From November 25th through December 2nd, get 25% off everything on orders of $150 or more. From bold hoops to minimalist stacks and a few diamonds sprinkled in here and there, Missouri makes handcrafted fine jewelry for every day. Each piece is made with responsibly sourced materials so you can look and feel good about gifting and wearing them. Find something for everyone, especially yourself. Shop your wish list 25% off online at Missouri.com, in-store, and in-app. Hi, who here loves when their nails are perfectly done? Me. I'm Sarah Gibson Tuttle, and I started Olive in June because, let's be real, we all deserve to have gorgeous nails, but who wants to spend a fortune or half their day at the salon? And that's why I created the Manny System, so you can have that salon-perfect manicure right at home. And guess what? The best part? Each Manny only costs $2. Yep, you heard me, $2. No more $30, $40, $50 salon trips that eat up your day. Now you can paint your nails whenever you want, wherever you want. And trust me, you're going to be obsessed with your nails and everyone is going to ask you, where did you get your nails done? And here's a little something extra. Head over to oliveandjune.com and get 20% off your first Manny system with code PERFECTMANNY20 at oliveandjune.com slash PERFECTMANNY20. That's code PERFECTMANNY20 for 20% off at oliveandjune.com slash perfectmanny20. You're all set for a nail glow up. Let's get those nails looking fabulous, shall we? You know, as a busy mom, there are a few ways you can build strong muscles. You could get a gym membership, which you'll never use, buy all sorts of expensive equipment for your garage that you'll forget you have, pay for a personal trainer that you'll never have time to meet with, and buy a fitness watch that only makes you sad every time you look at it. Or you could go for an easy run and try some milk, which helps build strong muscles. Visit GunnaNeedMilk.com for more info. And please, don't make yourself sad. Hey, I'm Julian Morgans, and you're listening to What It Was Like. The show that asks people who have lived through big, dramatic events what it was like. Hey, and welcome back. This is part two of our two part series on the Order of the Solar Temple. In Ep 1, we got to know the leaders of the cult and we watched them transform from relatively harmless eccentrics, into tyrants. And if you haven't heard that episode, what are you doing? Don't start at number two. Go go back. Go back. Start at number one. Do this properly. But for the rest of you, we're going to use this app to unpack the cult's very messy end. This episode is going to take us through a series of mass suicides. It's it's kind of gory. It's a, you know, it's a pretty grim episode in a lot of ways, but I think it can teach us a lot. A lot about fanaticism, a lot about the nature of beliefs. Who exactly kills themselves for a cult? Let's find out. Our story in the last ep just ended with a triple murder in the ski town of Morin Heights, about an hour outside of Montreal. And on the same day, on the 30th of September, 1994, in Switzerland, the cult's leaders, Demambro and Jurette, were seen having dinner with seven others at a five-star hotel next to a lake. At that point, the couple with the baby weren't dead in Quebec, but the cult's assassins were on a plane somewhere over the Atlantic en route to meet them. So in this moment, witnesses say that they saw Jurette and Demambo eating dinner, and every now and then they'd get up and go and make a phone call, and then they'd sit back down at the table and just sort of resume the conversation. And we know that around that time... They were busily organizing a meeting, or they were calling it a meeting, inverted commas. And what they'd done was that they told a list of variously disgruntled members and ex-members that they were about to get their money back. I've mentioned that in the last years of the Solar Temple, many people left, and many of those departures were due to disputes about money. The Solar Temple was a wealthy organization. You know, as, as far as cults go, they had millions of dollars in cash and real estate spread around the world, but all that money had been donated by members, and a lot of them wanted it back. 
So Jurette and Demembo, they told a list of about 20 of their unhappiest benefactors to come to the farmhouse in Shiri for a meeting where they'd get their money back. And many agreed. At the top of the list was the principal investor in the farmhouse, Albert Jacobino, who'd bought the property to grow macrobiotic foods. He'd fallen into a bitter fight with Demambo, and he was relieved to hear that they were going to hold a meeting and he'd be reimbursed. And he even brought along his friend, Marie-Louise Rubiano, who was previously the group's astrologer. Another former member named Robert Falladu also got on a flight from Montreal to Switzerland to represent the cult's members in Quebec. And another notable invite was actually Jurette's ex-wife. Her and Jurette had married in the early 1980s, but they'd divorced after their only child died in infancy. Now, you might have already picked up on this, but Jurette and Demambo had no intention of reimbursing anyone for any money. Instead, this was a hit list. The two men privately referred to the people invited to Shiri as traitors, and they were inviting them to a massacre. Their plan, right from the very beginning, was to gather everyone who they felt had wronged the temple and then murder them. So here, we arrive at my first major point, my first major bit of analysis. I know that the title of these shows is The Swiss Cult That Ended With Five Mass Suicides, but really, really, in all honesty, this, this title is a bit of an oversimplification. It's a bit of clickbait, because not all of the suicides were suicides. And really, what took place under the farm in this little town in Shiri, it was actually a massacre. It was a trap for former members lured there under false pretense, and they were slaughtered. Only three or four of those people died willingly. And in a moment, we'll dig into some learnings, but, but let's just stay on the timeline. So this ex-member, Robert Falladu, he arrives in Switzerland from Montreal, and he thinks it's going to be a quick stay. He'd actually booked a return flight on the next day, on the 3rd. And when he arrived on the 2nd, he called his wife, and he said, everything's fine, it's all good. But actually, we know now that he called a friend right after the phone call to his wife. And he told this friend, this is a quote, Things are happening here that I do not understand at all. And that phone call, that was the last time anyone heard from him. That evening, he drove out to the farmhouse in Shiri to find Jurette welcoming members as they poured in from around Switzerland and France. And to be clear, this was the farmhouse that we started with in part one. It was a cold late afternoon and the autumn leaves were turning red around the farm. And I imagine that there were a few cars parked in the drive and some big hugs. You know, these are people who haven't seen each other for a while. Maybe a few tepid handshakes too. A lot of these friendships had become openly hostile, so there were probably some pretty awkward moments. A few families arrived too, including a husband and wife with their two teenage kids, a 16-year-old girl and her 18-year-old brother. Also a mother arrived with her 11-year-old son, Sebastian. They all filed down the steps into the hidden temple, and it went quite smoothly at first. We don't actually know what happened down there. It's impossible to know. There were no survivors. But investigators believe that once they were inside the temple, the doors were locked, and everyone was in that first room. You know, the one that I talked about with all the suitcases stacked on the desks and the red walls. So once they were in there, Jurette addressed the congregation. Tamambu wasn't there, but a series of phone calls indicate that they were in constant communication. It seems like there were two other ringleaders as well. A man named Daniel Jaton, who was the father to the two teenage children, also placed several phone calls to Tamambu. And the string that was used to tie up the victims, it was found in his pocket. And then there was Joel Egger, who you already know. He was the fanatical former drug addict who had just returned from Quebec after the triple homicide. So investigators believe the evening began with Jurette addressing the group, while Egger and Jaton stood on either side of the room like bouncers. And it seems as though the first victim was Elbert Jacobino, the farm owner. Again, we don't know what happened, but Elbert wasn't found in the temple. Investigators speculated that he'd been the loudest voice of dissent, so maybe Joel Egger had invited him for a walk just to cool down. Perhaps then, once outside, he was shot and bundled into bed. His body may have even been hidden from the others to avoid panic. After that, most of the bodies, they showed some sign of struggle. Almost all of the victims had at least one gunshot wound to the head. 
One victim was shot no less than nine times in the head and the neck. And in just two cases, there was no evidence of external intervention, and the cause of death could not be established for three other victims. Everyone was killed with a Smith Wesson 22 pistol that had been bought by Egger, who was also responsible for rigging up the ignition system to burn the buildings down. Obviously, this system only worked on the upstairs part of the barn. Based on phone records, the massacre continued into the early hours of October the 3rd, when Jarette finally called Demambo to inform him that the operation had been a success. After that, another call was placed by Egger, also to Demambo. Finally, at about 8am, the Sherry mailman witnessed a red Ford Fiesta containing two young men coming down from the farm and heading towards the village. And that was it. We can assume that this was Jarette and Egger leaving behind the bodies of 23 temple members who lay scattered and bleeding throughout the underground chambers and lay there for the whole next day and the next night until the incendiary devices in the barn were triggered on the evening of October the 4th. And here, I want to return to my central question of the episode. How do mass suicides occur? And I think that what we can take from the massacre at Shiri is that obedience exists on a sliding scale. There were some there who died by suicide, but, but the vast majority were murdered. I started this episode making comparisons with Jonestown, and a few of you got in touch to point out that Jonestown was actually a mass murder, not a suicide. And you're absolutely right. That was actually the point that I was holding off making until right now. Let's get into it. Jonestown, which was run by Christian minister Jim Jones, ended in 1978 when 909 people, about half of them children, were forced to drink cyanide. Newspapers at the time called the event a mass suicide, but it happened under armed guard in an incredibly remote jungle compound in the South American country of Guyana. Suicide was at gunpoint, and there was nowhere to run. So historians now agree that Jonestown should be classified a mass murder-suicide, not a mass suicide. Quick note here, I actually interviewed a Jonestown survivor on my last podcast, and he talked about the conditioning that led over 900 people to their deaths. I think it's very illuminating, so I'm going to link out to that episode in the show notes. Anyway, the same Jonestown dynamics played out in Sherry. The members were at gunpoint with nowhere to go. Most were murdered. And yet, a small number, a very small number, went willingly. As I said, several children died in the catastrophe, and one of these kids was 11-year-old Sebastian Pershow, who had glued a sheet of paper on the wall above his bed with a handwritten note. And the note said this, For our master, who is guiding us step by step on the big path to the eternal light. I mean, that seems like a message penned by a kid who was pretty devoted to the cult. Or, I guess, a kid with a mother who was. Anyway, let's stay on the day of October the 3rd. Jurette and Ego have now fled the farm, and the next eyewitness account places Demambo having lunch with his inner circle at a restaurant called the St. Christopher Restaurant in the Swiss town of Bex. And I looked the place up, and the restaurant's still there. If you want a dark tourism experience, you can go. Um, four out of five stars on TripAdvisor, if you're interested. Anyway, a witness later said that the lunch party had an absent and sad air about them, and they barely ate. And I don't think that's surprising, given the carnage they'd just overseen. But also keep in mind that this is their last day on planet Earth. These people were all planning to die the next night on October 4, so I guess a heavy, somber mood at the table was understandable. And it's unknown what Dimambo and Jurette did with their last night. But we do know that the following morning, Jurette was seen at 10am in a grocery store buying garbage bags. These were later used to cover the heads of the dead. And that same morning, the families of those killed at Sherry were starting to get worried Robert Faladu's wife was frantically calling the other members after her husband missed his flight back to Montreal. Dumambo actually had his wife call and tell her that Robert was just doing fine and he was actually hanging out with another member. Robert's wife would find out that uh, he was actually dead in the next few days. Then, at about 4pm, Jarette arrived at the Les Roches de Crystal Chalet in the resort town of Sullivan. And this is 
another extremely cute Swiss town about an hour away from Sherry. The whole village is perched on a hillside with the Alps towering above the medieval buildings. And Girette had announced that another congregation would take place here at the chalet. And this time, most of the attendees were aware that this would be their final transit to the Star of Sirius. But some more so-called traitors were again told that this was an opportunity to get their money back. And at the top of traitor list number two was a guy named Terry Huguenot. And he's unique because he's one of the cult's very few survivors. He'd joined a few years earlier, only to have his marriage split up, and his wife, who was in her 30s, told to hook up with Demambro's 14-year-old son. Despite this, somehow Terry's loyalty persisted, until he started to feel like he was being financially exploited. And at that point, he left the group and started pestering Demambro for a refund, until finally the cult leader agreed. Come to the Selvin Chalet, he was told, and we'll have your money waiting for you in an envelope. So on the afternoon of October the 4th, 1994, Terry drove from Geneva to the chalet. But when he parked his car and met Jurette at the door, something felt wrong. He later said that Jurette was acting weird while Edgar, quote, wasn't in his right mind. Then when he was ushered into the chalet, the smell of petrol hit him like a brick. He says the building, which was basically a barn-shaped holiday unit, smelled like it was about to explode. So he politely stepped back outside and managed to slip away. Then he drove back to Geneva and later learned about the mass suicide via the news. And Terry wrote about all of this in a book called Le 54 which translates to The 54th, and that's a significant title. As Terry explained, Dimambo wanted his mass suicides to claim exactly 54 victims. And this is because back in the 14th century, 54 Knights Templar were burned at the stake. So Dimambro, he wanted this historical echo. He believed that if the solar temple had exactly 54 victims, this would kind of turbocharge their passage across the universe to the star of Sirius, where they'd be in paradise forever. But Terry got in the way of this plan. He snuck off and Dimambro and Jurette's double massacre claimed 53 lives, leaving Terry as the very much alive 54th. After Terry bailed, we know that everyone else arrived on time, and the massacre went ahead in two chalets, basically as planned. Again, we don't know exactly the series of events, but a few details stand out. First of all, there's the fact that Demambro took his children to die with him. You'll remember that he had a daughter named Emanuela. She was only 12 years old, and he also took his 25-year-old son Siegfried Demambro, And they were known to have an extremely fractured relationship, so there's been some speculations that his death was actually a kind of revenge. And then there were the two mothers who both took their children. One of these kids was aged four, the other was aged ten. And then everyone at the chalet, including the kids, was injected with a heavy mix of benzodiazepines and opioids. So it was hopefully quite a peaceful death. But still. Thinking about this, I'm reminded of the 2004 German film downfall. You might remember it. It centers around the last days of Hitler and his inner circle in a bunker in Berlin. And there's this final scene, this this amazing but very hard to watch final scene where Hitler and his comrades, they realize they've lost. The war's over and they're about to get smashed by the Red Army. And you watch as, as Joseph Goebbels' wife, Magda, she poisons their six children with cyanide capsules in this, this very motherly way. The kids are asleep and she just goes around this little room in the bunker, tenderly placing a capsule in each child's mouth, and then she clamps their jaw together to crush the casing, and then their heads slump over. And I feel like this scene might help to illustrate what happened in this ski chalet in Sullivan. This grim sense of duty, this very upside down kind of love. I've mentioned a few times before, I've, I've got a three-year-old daughter. And the notion that anyone could willingly poison their kid just makes my brain stop working. I just don't believe in anything enough to hurt my own kid. And yet, these parents did. They were so far inside this story that they were willing to hurt their own children. And that is faith. That is, that is total conviction. And I guess what we can take away from that is that if the previous meeting beneath the farmhouse in Sherry, if that was a mass murder 
than this second one in Sullivan. It was, it was mostly suicide. Later, one investigator described how this fanatical belief was illustrated to him while working on the case. This was a few months after the deaths, and he described how a temple member came into his office one day dressed in a dark red cape. And she was devastated, she said, not because her friends had died, but because she wasn't invited to the transit with the rest of the group. And this investigator replied, transit? What? People with bullets in their heads? What kind of transit is that? And apparently she looked at this investigator, you know, this cop, she looked at him straight in the eye and she said this, no, they all wanted the transit, but they didn't have the courage to go. I might not have had the courage either, and I would have been happy if someone had helped me. If it was necessary, why not? So there you go. That's the kind of devotion that this cult inspired in its members. It's adult members, at least. But children? I, I don't know. I don't think so. I think that's just murder. And I found another interview with a town official who entered this chalet to find all of these dead kids. And I think, I think I've got a quote here that really illustrates that horror. This man, this town official... He said this. Behind this door, a shock. There were bodies lying there, completely burned. There were children. I immediately thought that they'd been drugged because I saw them with their thumbs in their mouths. They must have been sleeping peacefully when everything happened. And it's details like that that make me squirm. Okay, so back to the timeline of what happened in this chalet. And we actually have some evidence of what occurred right at the very end, right before the fire. And that comes in the form of a VHS video. This videotape was discovered by investigators, and it shows about a dozen followers, including Jurette, Demambro, and Joel Egger, sharing what looks like their final meal. I haven't seen this video, I've just read about it, but a few accounts suggest that they're sitting at a dining room table in the chalet, and they're singing. They're singing the Knights of the Round Table, and then they raise their glasses at the end to a toast and they drink a liquid, which seems to make them sleepy. And in the last few minutes of this video, they're kind of slumped against each other. Some of them look asleep. And then the video ends showing two of the children who seem either unconscious or dead before the camera pans to Demambro's wife, who seems equally motionless on the floor. After that, at 11.33 p.m., Demambro called Edgar one last time. I actually don't know why, as Mega was also found dead at the chalet with him. But we do know that it was a 39-second call. And Edgar, after that, he triggered this remote control ignition system via the telephone, which set off the fires in both Sherry and Sullivan. 25 people were found dead in Sullivan, nearly all burned beyond recognition. Jurette and Demambro's bodies had to be identified via dental records. Over the next few days, the fires in Switzerland were connected to the fire in Quebec, and the scale of this atrocity became known. Newspapers around the world ran stories on the case, which you can still read in various archives. Both the LA and New York Times seemed particularly interested in the case, but all the earlier reports are full of speculation. No one knew much about the cult or their motivations, and all of them talk about a manhunt for Jurette and Demambro. As I said, later they were identified at the chalet by their dental records. And then... A tide of letters arrived in mailboxes around the world. The letters had been written by Demambro about a week earlier. He'd titled these letters The Testament, and they were basically a description of the cult's beliefs and a justification of their actions. Basically a suicide note. There were four pages with four headlines. The first one was, To all those who can still understand the voice of wisdom, we addressed this last message. And then there was The Rose and the Cross. And then there was another page titled, Transit to the Future, and finally, To Lovers of Justice. In these letters, he explained that they were not dying by suicide, but in fact, embarking on a transit. And the quote was, This is in no way a suicide in the human sense of the term. Instead, Demambro insisted that they were acquiring these new, quote, solar bodies, and they were going to be reunited on the star Sirius, where they'd live in happiness for the rest of eternity. The other thing that the letters did was reiterate how the cult had been persecuted for such a long time that their own lives were no longer tenable. They had to die, and this was not their fault. But I think the most interesting detail in these letters was a fifth page, added to only some of them. 
It seems like it was a little postscript added after the massacre at Sherry, and it was Demembro's way of not just admitting that the deaths at Sherry had been a massacre, but blaming Jurette for its cruelty. Following the tragic Sherry transit, he wrote, We wish to make it clear on behalf of the Rosy Cross that we deplore and totally disassociate ourselves from the barbaric, incompetent, and aberrant behaviour of Dr. Luc Jurette. Taking the decision to act on his own authority against all our rules, he has transgressed our code of honour and the cause of a veritable carnage that should have been a transit carried out in honour, peace and light. His departure does not correspond to the ethics we represent and defend to posterity. So that's interesting, right? That's a real window into their relationship at the time. But I think it also says a lot about Jurette. You know, when I'm watching videos of this guy talking, when I'm on YouTube and I watch Luc Jurette giving a talk, I can actually imagine him as a killer. He's just so intense. I can see him in this underground temple at Sherry, coldly shooting members of his congregation one by one, and then him and Edgar spending an hour dragging the bodies around to arrange them in a circle. It would have been hideous, messy work, but I can imagine him doing it. And it's interesting that Demembro actually takes on a tone here, like he's been kind of spooked by his co-founder. You know, there's an air about this letter that's kind of like, whoa, this guy, this guy is nuts. He's not one of us. These letters were received by various historians through Europe and lots of newspapers. Um, and some of them were actually addressed to big public names too, like Bill Clinton. But uh, I couldn't actually find any indication that Bill had received his. Anyway, these letters, it was quickly established that Patrick Vornet, the, the heir of the French ski wear brand, he was the guy who'd sent the letters. He was still alive, and he was immediately rounded up and questioned by the police. And he claimed that he was simply the messenger. You know, don't shoot the messenger. He didn't know anything. So he was released without charge. But he would remain under police surveillance for the rest of his life. More on that in a minute. Meanwhile, hundreds of journalists arrived in the villages of Sherry and Sullivan to cover the story, and the sky buzzed with helicopters. The police trawled through the ashes of two burned chalets for weeks, but the buildings remained there for months. Here's a quote from the local official on the chalet units in Sullivan. It was an unbearable sight of horror. These two chalets were ruins, ruins that remained there for months and months. I did everything I could to obtain permission to demolish these houses. In the end, the municipality managed to buy this land for a few tens of thousands of francs, and the buildings were razed. In the last months of 1994, fear of cults spread through France and Switzerland. And what seemed to shock people the most was that the victims didn't fit the usual image of vulnerable, easily influenced cult members. Whereas Jonestown attracted a much poorer, less socially mobile congregation, the followers of the Solar Temple were wealthy, and they held down jobs in high places. A French parliamentary commission was even set up to map out the country's alternative religions and to keep tabs on those suspected of posing a risk to society. New laws were also passed, making it harder for sects to claim immunity from prosecution for crimes. But to me, what is truly surprising and, and really quite unique in the world of cults is how these suicides, these mass murder suicides, they continued a year later. And we're going to hear about that in a moment. But first, please stick around for a quick ad break. To make switching to the new Boost Mobile risk-free, we're offering a 30-day money-back guarantee. So why wouldn't you switch from Verizon or T-Mobile? Because you have nothing to lose. Boost Mobile is offering a 30-day money-back guarantee. No, I asked why wouldn't you switch from Verizon or T-Mobile. Oh. Wouldn't. Uh, because you love wasting money as a way to punish yourself because your mother never showed you enough love as a child? Whoa. Easy there. Yeah. Applies to online activations. Requires port in and auto pay. Customers activating in stores may be charged non-refundable activation fees. So good, so good, so good. Perfect gifts? We've got them at Nordstrom Rack Stores now. Ugg, Nike, Barefoot Dreams, Kate Spade New York, and more. Find everything on their wish list all in one place. Steve Madden? Yes, please. It's perfect. Did we just score? The greatest gifts of all time? Yeah. yeah. Head to your Nordstrom Rack store to score. Great brands, great prices, the greatest gifts of all time. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices 
down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. Weight loss. It needs to be fast and sustainable. Noom GLP-1 starts at just $149 and ships to your door in seven days. Take it from Lauren, who lost 22 pounds on Noom. If I come off of the GLP-1, it's not going to automatically make my weight yo-yo back. $149 GLP-1s? Now that's Noom smart. Get started at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. Individual results may vary. Not all customers will medically qualify for prescription medications. Compounded medications are not reviewed by the FDA for safety, efficacy, or quality. Hey, welcome back. Before the break, we just made our way through mass murder-suicide number three. And now, just a few months after the deaths in Switzerland, 27-year-old Patrick Vornat, the ski fashioner who was the one who posted de Mambro's letters, he gave an interview with a French magazine called Le Espresse and publicly renounced his faith in the solar temple. And he said this, What I thought was true is false and I failed to recognize that. So I've burned all of my capes and got rid of all of my papers. That's what he said, but it it turns out he wasn't really telling the truth. Instead, he was in constant contact with another member of the cult, a 50-year-old Swiss psychotherapist named Christiane Bonnet. This woman claimed that she could communicate with Jorette and Demambo in the afterlife as a medium. And one journalist who had actually interviewed Bonnet, he called her a fanatic, totally committed to the OTS's ideology. And the police who'd interviewed her after the deaths, after all the mass suicides, they noted that she'd acted cold, distant, and contemptuous, denying that she'd known anything about the deaths. But unknown to police, a loose affiliation of underground survivors had coalesced around Christiane Bonnet, and she was advocating that they too join the group on Sirius. Then in early December of 1995, these members all received a call from Burnett with a message from Demambo. It's officially our turn, she told them. We'll be called to transit very soon. Get ready. Patrick Vornat was one of the 16 who responded to this call. He disappeared from Geneva, where he lived, and he drove to France with his mother, Edith, and his girlfriend, Uta, and Uta's six-year-old daughter, Tania. Another man to respond was a French policeman named Jean-Pierre Ladanche. He had joined the cult in 1990, and Dimambro allegedly considered him the group's enforcer. This man is also about to serve as the group's executioner, so I'm going to give him a bit of context. I found some information on this guy, and, and apparently he was heavily in debt, and he was described by people as being dull and withdrawn. He actually also told Christiana Burnett that he could facilitate the group's transit to Sirius, meaning that he could supply some police service weapons and execute people. On the night of December 15, Burnett made a series of personal calls to members, and one by one, they dropped everything and headed to France. One man, Andre Friedley, left work early, claiming that he was sick. As it turns out, he would later collaborate with Jean-Pierre in the murders, Andre's wife also left work early, and her co-workers noticed that she seemed worried. Four of these members left behind suicide notes at their homes. Bonnet's note was unique. She didn't write much. She just left a blank sheet of paper with a single line scrawled across the middle. Blank page, everything said. Alongside it, she left a letter addressed to her son, writing, Death does not exist and is pure illusion. May we always find ourselves through the inner life. By 10 p.m. that evening, all 16 members had gathered in the village of saint pierre de Charnay, nestled in the Varicos Mountains. Again, there are probably some of you who uh, speak French and you're like, that's not how you pronounce it. And you're right, apologies. Anyway, from there, they drove up the narrow, winding roads to the Fars Plateau. Finally, they parked their cars along the road and set off into the forest on foot. They walked about 1.5 kilometers in the dark, and I think this would have been hard. It was midwinter, cold and drizzling, 
And the forest is really rocky. When you look at photos of it now, like crime scene photos, there's these big boulders and, and just sort of all these rocks sort of jutting out of the ground. So lots of stuff to trip on. And really hard, given that they had three young children with them, aged six, four, and two. I assume that the two-year-old got carried the whole way. Eventually, the group reached a small clearing with a hollow in the middle. And there, they built a fire and they sat in a circle. And then each member swallowed a heavy dose of sedatives. Once this circle of members had fallen unconscious, Jean-Pierre and André carried out the killings. The two men shot each person at point-blank range. Each adult received a 22 caliber shot to the head and then another one to the heart. And another heartbreaking detail here involving kids. Investigators suspect that the mothers with young children tried to resist once they realized their kids were probably about to die. Both mothers were found with skull fractures, likely from being struck with blunt objects. In the end, Jean-Pierre killed his own wife and his daughters, aged four and two. Patrick Vornette's partner, Uta Verona, was also killed, along with her six-year-old daughter. Once everyone was dead, petrol was poured all over the bodies. Then they were set alight, before each executioner shot themselves in the head with the service revolver. André fell into the fire, while Jean-Pierre slumped face down in the dirt. And then, it was quiet, and these bodies smoldered in the rain. And they lay there for all the next week, while the French and Swiss authorities started to receive a tide of missing person reports. By late December, someone leaked to the media that the police were investigating another cult-linked mass disappearance, and the story became front-page news. And then on the 22nd of December, a hunter from the village saw a news item on the TV and recalled that he'd seen several cars with Swiss number plates parked near the forest. He'd also been out in the forest, and he'd got a strange whiff of a smell that he described like burnt leather or human flesh. Like death. Based on this, he called the police, who drove out to the village to find several cars that were quickly identified as belonging to temple members. Fearing the worst, they closed the roads and brought in hundreds of police, several canine units, and a helicopter to start a search. And finally, at 9am the following morning, Just two days before Christmas, the bodies of the 16 temple members and their children were found in the clearing. There are lots of photos of this clearing on the internet. I think the best ones are on Getty, if you'd like to have a look. And what you'll see is a small heap of ash in a pine forest. The bodies have been removed, but the ground is all burned and scraped up. And the weather looks miserable, and the investigators are all wearing heavy jackets. There's lots of media too. Dozens of people holding big 90s analog cameras, and everyone looks pretty grim. And looking at this scene, you get a sense of how dense and wet the forest is. And for me, it just brings home, again, the horror of these people trudging out there in the dark, knowing that they were about to die. Or in many cases, not knowing they were about to die, feeling uneasy. As before, it's unknown how many members thought this was a one-way trip. I said before that four of them left suicide notes, so at least four of them. But remember this survivor named Terry? His personal theory was that this four, they were the only ones who thought it was a suicide. Terry actually said that the other ones, they'd likely been duped into thinking that they were headed to a kind of seance to see Demambro reappear in the forest. He thought that this was the only way that so many of them would have quickly dropped everything they were doing and traveled so quickly. These solar temple massacres, they always followed the same pattern. There were a few fanatical members driving the bloodshed, with the others kind of blundering into a trap. I asked at the start of the show how these things go down. That was, the, that was sort of the premise I gave for the, for the episode. And I think, really, the headline here, the answer, is via coercion. A kind of peer pressure takes hold. And it's hard in these situations, these sort of mass suicide, ritualized death situations, maybe it's even sacrilegious to resist, or that people who do resist, they just get beaten or they're shot. The only silver lining here is that finally, there are some people in this story, in this enormous chronology, who did resist. And they actually survived. Not at this scene in 1995, but two years later, in 1997. And they were teenage children 
of some Canadian members who told their parents that they didn't want to die. And these survivors, these people, they're, they're still alive today. So now we're going to discuss the fifth and final mass murder suicide right now. Remember the first was the couple in Quebec with the baby. And then there were the two in Switzerland, one in a chalet and the other one beneath a farmhouse. And then we've just had the one in France in the forest. So we're going to go back to Canada now, back to Quebec. And this is the last mass murder suicide in 1997. And it all started with a French couple, Didier and Chantelle Quizzy, aged 39 and 41 respectively. They'd moved to Quebec to be closer to Jorette, and they were apparently distraught when their guru died without them. But they're also a bit miffed that they weren't invited to transit to Sirius. They were originally school teachers, but by 1997 they were managing a bakery and practicing their beliefs in secret. By this point, the Solar Temple had been officially banned by the government of Quebec, and the couple had been interrogated by police after the massacre at Moran Heights, along with about 100 other members and former members across Canada. But despite their loyalty to the group, they weren't exactly popular. Other members described Didier as a know-it-all, while his wife was described as kind of passive and unassertive. Another member described them as withdrawn, haughty, and bad-tempered. And the couple's three children, two boys and a girl, aged between 13 and 16, they were banned from joining sports teams, and according to their classmates, they were rarely seen outside the house, where they lived with their grandmother, 63-year-old Susanna Drow. Didier was placed under police watch in July 1996, after a rumour started up of an impending mass suicide. And I actually found an article quoting an investigator who visited this couple and begged them, hey, if you ever decide to do a transit, if this rumour is true, please just don't take your kids. And here's what he said Didier responded with. When I met them a second time, a few months before they committed suicide, I begged them, please don't bring the children with you. And they sang me a beautiful song. I guess this last bit is uh, kind of French-Canadian for they promised they wouldn't. But on March 21st, 1997, two newspapers in Quebec received a letter from Didier. And just like Demambro's, it was headlined Testament, and its message was basically the same. We've had enough of this life. We prefer to die. Something that I thought was interesting was that the way that the letter threatened Terry, the survivor, um, it, it's, uh, it's got this little bit here that says, as for the pseudo 54th, remember his whole thing was being about this 54th survivor, as for the pseudo 54th, he should know that the welcoming committee is waiting for him. However, surprisingly, none of the newspapers published this letter. They all thought it was a hoax. But what they didn't know was that the night before, this couple, Didier and Chantel, they had drugged their kids by giving them juice laced with sedatives. The parents then set up an elaborate mechanism involving propane tanks, gas canisters, stoves, and a timer, all designed to set fire to the house. But on the early morning of the 21st, one of the teens woke up to the stink of gas. She padded through the house to find her dad unconscious and then stumbled upon the setup that was meant to burn the house down. It hadn't worked. It just hadn't gone off. So this kid, this, this uh, 13-year-old girl, she's shocked and unsure what to think, but she woke up her siblings and the three of them quickly took action. They aired out the house, they shot off the propane, and they dismantled the setup, all while their parents remained asleep. When the adults finally woke up, they were confronted by the kids. And at first, Chantel reassured them that they weren't going to try to kill them ever again. But Didier contradicted her, saying that maybe they would try again, but with one change. The kids could decide for themselves whether they wanted to join or not. And apparently the girl went along with it, but was talked out of it by her brother. And the rest of the day was spent nursing the adults, who were apparently weak and sick from a mixture of sedatives and propane inhalation. Later that day, the school principal called the house, concerned about the kid's absence, and the eldest boy answered and claimed that his siblings were sick and needed care. That night, thinking that the adults were too ill to try again, the kids went to sleep. But what they didn't know was that Didier had already drugged them again by hiding sedatives in their food. And during the night, Didier suffocated his mother-in-law with a plastic bag, apparently with her consent, and tried to restart the ignition system. 
It just seems like he was desperate. He had this plan. He wanted to make this transit to Sirius and nothing was going to stop him, even, even the pleas of his teenage kids. But again, by some miracle, he couldn't get this device to work. He couldn't get the timer to line up, just like the thing wouldn't go off. Again, the teenagers woke up to find their dad trying to get this thing to start. And they're all like, no, absolutely not. And then they spent the morning pleading with their parents to just please stop. But Didier insisted that there was no turning back after his mother-in-law's death. He and Chantel once again asked the kids if they would join them. And this time, all three of them refused. At this point, the parents relented. They would allow their kids to live just so long as they didn't interfere with their parents' transit. So the compromise was that the kids had to all be drugged and sent to a shed out in the garden while the parents burned down the house. But again, a third time, the kids woke up in this shed to find the parents' house still intact. So they wandered inside to find their parents even sicker than before, but still determined. And the kids begged their mum and dad to stop. But now their mum insisted that these kids, they were actually responsible and they would need to set the house on fire once the parents were asleep. By late afternoon, they complied. The parents took themselves into the upstairs rooms and the kids manually started the fire before retreating to the shed with some personal items and, quote, some memories of their parents. At around 6pm, firefighters arrived to find the house fully ablaze and they extinguished the fire within an hour. And inside, they found four charred bodies in the master room arranged in a crucifix formation with rose petals scattered around. The grandmother's body was found on the first floor and police investigators quickly observed that the ignition setup resembled devices that had been used in earlier cult-related incidents. As firefighters worked, the teenagers emerged from the garden shed, disorientated and still high. They were taken in for medical evaluation and questioned by police. Later, they were made to identify their parents' bodies, which they made the youngest son do. According to police, after learning of the death of their parents, only the eldest son cried. The children were questioned by police, and they said they didn't remember what had happened exactly, likely due to the drugs. While awaiting the decision as to whether they'd be charged, their schoolmates wrote them letters and recorded them a video. They were later allowed to contact their classmates, but not allowed to discuss what had happened. On the 24th of April, the Quebec Ministry of Justice stated that they weren't going to press criminal charges against the kids, even though they were responsible for their parents' deaths. But responsibility was mitigated by the fact that they'd been drugged, while, quote, the culture of a cult that nurtures psychological destabilization annihilates the critical spirit and that the children experienced, quote, a complete psychological drift. And that's the story. So they got off. And it seems likely to me that these same teenagers from the 1997 incident are now probably adults living quiet lives in Quebec. And a really weird little coincidence happened on the same day as the Quebec suicide. And that is that the members of a completely unrelated cult called Heaven's Gate began a mass suicide in California. Both groups shared similar beliefs, particularly around the idea that suicide could somehow lead to interstellar salvation. But Heaven's Gate had timed their deaths to coincide with the Haley Bop comet, while the latest casualties of the Solar Temple, they died on March 22 simply because their incendiary device failed three times earlier. So there was no correlation. It was just one of those weird, cosmic, random acts of chance that lined up these two mass suicides not so far away from each other on exactly the same date. And that was the final event that marked the end of the Order of the Solar Temple. In total, the cult claimed the lives of 74 people. And as you'd expect, the fallout stretched on for years, and especially in the courts. One prominent figure caught up in the legal mess was a well-known Swiss orchestra conductor and an associate of Dimambro. He faced trial for his alleged role in the deaths, but was acquitted due to insufficient evidence. A second trial in France ended the same way, another acquittal. I actually found this guy. Uh, he's got a website, and I emailed him to see if he'd come on the show. I never heard back. Throughout the late 90s and early 2000s, a flurry of biographies and accounts from survivors came out all in French. This case, as I said at the very beginning, it's never really broken into the English-speaking world. So unless you can read French, 
these books kind of remain out of reach. But interestingly, there were some connections to Australia. I was surprised to find that after the cult's collapse, Australian authorities started investigating visa and banking records. And it was reported, although disputed, that the cult had managed to funnel two deposits of $93 million into Australian bank accounts during the early 90s. But really interesting, I think, was a claim of ritual suicides that had happened in Australia. One Solar Temple member actually sent a letter that mentioned several deaths on March 31st, 1993, and another on January 6th, 1994, in Sydney. However, I couldn't find any records of bodies or any incidences matching those claims on those dates, so it's unclear if these were real or just part of the cult's propaganda. What is confirmed, though, is that the cult definitely owned property in Australia, and they even held rituals at the base of Uluru. Dimambro himself spent about six months in Australia from November 1993 to April of 1994, and we know this because of visa records. Also, records show that he rented a house on the Gold Coast, and Jurette, he also travelled to Australia several times, with immigration records showing that he visited at least five times between 1989 and his death in 1994. So I found all of this stuff about how uh, Dimambro lived in a house on the Gold Coast and Girat, they used to they used to hang out here and Uluru and stuff. I found all of this stuff in an article in the LA Times. And I even actually managed to track down a Gold Coast car rental agent who'd been quoted in a 1994 LA Times article. Um, and the quote was that he described Girat as being calm and charismatic. So I found this guy, I managed to track him down. But unfortunately, he couldn't remember much beyond that. And um, it ended up being a bit of a dead end. But still, kind of interesting to imagine Demembro laying low after Jurette's arrest and just hanging out on the Gold Coast, you know, possibly doing a bit of time at SeaWorld. Um, I don't know. I feel like 1983 would have been peak SeaWorld. But anyway, what do we learn? What have we learned here? Well, I think that I've learned that, that most people aren't willing to die for their beliefs. Most people live on a sliding scale of belief. And when it comes down to it, most of us, most of us have to be coerced at gunpoint to die. That's what happened in Jonestown, and it's what happened for most of the members of the Solar Temple. But, but let's like drill down into that a bit further, because really that's unsurprising. Like Most people aren't going to die for their beliefs, but some people are. You know, There are people who are willing to do that. And these are the fanatics. And this, this fraction of the general population who, placed in a cult situation, are willing to die for whatever they believe in, they're weird. But here's the thing. I don't think fanatics know they're fanatics until they find themselves placed in the right culty conditions. When I think about this, I'm actually reminded of a documentary that I saw on HBO about the cult Nexium. Do you remember this one? Um, so it's called The Vow. And there was an interview with a Canadian actress named Sarah Edmondson who, who joined the cult. She actually became uh, the leader of the Canadian branch of Nexium. So she was in the HBO documentary. And she's also got a TED Talk where she talks about why anyone can be indoctrinated. And she says this, You're not immune to cultic influence. No one is. And I know some of you are thinking that it'll never happen to me. But if you think that you're not susceptible, you're more susceptible than you know. Because this stuff isn't obvious. Have you ever had a boss ask you to work late on weekends, asking you to prove your commitment to the company, and you felt like you couldn't say no? Or have you had a significant other text you constantly and love bomb you and made you feel special, only for them to ghost you and have you question your own worth? Or have you been part of a demanding social group and you knew that if you missed even one night, you might be on the outs for a while? It could be anything from a group of college friends to a book club. And remember, it doesn't matter how rational and skeptical you are, you're all susceptible. Because everyone's got something. Everyone has a hook. And I totally agree with her. After spending a few weeks of my life reading up on the Solar Temple... I just get the feeling that there's no one single thing that makes people die for their beliefs. Instead, it seems to be kind of like a medley of human insecurities manipulated. 
And I'll even go so far as to say that I've kind of seen this myself. I think some of the most religious people I know are the ones who, in my eyes, have this unique combination of kind of insecurity, but then also people who ask the biggest questions. You know, they're they're the ones who get really deep, really fast, and they want to have conversations with strangers about the nature of reality and existence of an afterlife. And I think it's this kind of thing where sometimes the people who want the most answers, who can be even more vulnerable to cult indoctrination. But there's a little bit of that in all of us, I think, which is why, again, I think all of us, including myself, we're all vulnerable. Given the right cult message at the right time, if I was in a sort of period of spiritual emptiness, I'm sure I'd go for it. And why? Because I'm human and and I just want to feel part of something big, you know, something meaningful. But I really like to think that I wouldn't be willing to kill for that desire. Today's episode was produced by Rachel Tuffery. It was mixed by Jimmy Saunders and he also did our theme music. Darcy Humphreys and Daniela Cantu are our interns. Our cover art is by Naomi Lee Beveridge. And this whole thing has been a super real production. You know, as a busy mom, there are lots of ways you can help yourself fall asleep. You could stare blankly at the ceiling and replay every conversation you've ever had. Count sheep, have a debate with your pillow, give up caffeine, try acupuncture, and buy a weighted blanket that will make you sweat profusely. Or you could try some milk, which has nutrients that support healthy sleep. Visit GunnaNeedMilk.com for more info. And for everyone's sake, please don't give up caffeine. When it comes to weight loss, no two people are the same. That's why Noom builds personalized plans based on your unique psychology and biology. Take Brittany. After years of unsustainable diets, Noom helped her lose 20 pounds and keep it off. I was definitely in a yo-yo cycle for years of just losing weight, gaining weight, and it was exhausting. And Stephanie. She's a former D1 athlete who knew she couldn't out-train her diet, and she lost 38 pounds. My relationship to food before Noom was never consistent. And Evan, he can't stand salads, but he still lost 50 pounds with Noom. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. Even through the pickiness, Noom taught me that building better habits builds a healthier lifestyle. I'm not doing this to get to a number. I'm doing this to feel better. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom users compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary.